Hi, thank you for listening to this video lesson. I've been having some difficulties with getting the sound to work, so hopefully this is recording loudly enough. Um, if you're having difficulty hearing, I suggest that you get some earbuds in and just um, see if that makes a difference. Um, this is the first lesson on polar area, and you can see some reminders here. Uh, we are going to have our practice AP test on April 30th, which is a Monday. That's the no calculator multiple choice. And then the block day that is after that will be the calculator multiple choice. It will also be 45 minutes, even though that's a block period, um, just because of the walk that happens on May 1st. All right, so we're going to start out with you trying these two questions. You are going to have to pause the video and then come back in a second and check your answers. For the first one, it's just really solving an equation. So let r equal zero and just solve that. Think of your trig lights. And for the second question, to do that integral, it is going to um, be imperative that you remember one of the trig identities that you need to know. Um, so please pause the video and then come back in a second when you have those worked out. Okay, hope you're not cheating and looking ahead without trying, but um, hopefully you tried these. Remember that you just set that equal to zero. And so the result of that would be that you got sine of two theta is equal to, oops, sorry about that, is equal to negative a half. And then you solve that resulting equation. And you know that because this is um, solving for two theta, as you can see over here, you're solving for two theta. And so, sorry, I'm a little awkward with the tablet. Solving for two theta, and so you need to think about the two angles that have a sine value of negative a half, and then remember that any um, rotation of two pi around the unit circle would give you the same um, value of sine equaling negative one half. And then when you divide three by the two, you get the actual solution for theta. That's a, tech, a skill that we will need in doing our polar problem. Um, over here, I have a list for you on the right here of all of the different um, trig identities that would be good to know. Um, so I would suggest, yeah, I didn't mean that this time. Um, I would suggest that you remind yourself of these three because off of those three, you can actually derive anything else that you would really need, um, including the identity you needed for this problem. So you can see here over on the right how um, we replaced Pythagorean identity in the double angle for cosine identity and reorganized it. And then this identity at the bottom is the one that um, we made use of in this particular problem, this guy over here. So, okay. So in this problem, we would first um, use that identity at the beginning and that gets rid of the square that is problematic. I mean, it's not problematic to have a cosine squared in the integrand if we had a sign as well, but otherwise we don't have the du part for a, a typical u substitution kind of question. And then after that, it just falls into place, right? You use a little monom denom with the two in the denominator, and then these two pieces are pretty straightforward. You do need to do a small substitution of the two on the inside and the valence to get the one half on the outside, okay? This is also something that gets used in polar. So both of these are just reminders of things that you already should have some awareness of. Um, at the bottom of the page there, you can see that this is like my little summary of all things that you would need polar-wise. Um, remember, polar coordinates, instead of being based on left-right motion versus up and down, like x and y coordinates are relative to an origin, um, in polar coordinates, you have a pole, that, that, you know, which is just a point somewhere. So here's our pole. And then from that pole, there are different amounts of rotation. And the rotations are defined the same way that the unit circle is, so that this direction of rotation is considered positive, and this um, direction of rotation is considered negative. Um, remember that if you have a negative r value, all that that means is that you would be going backwards um, along the direction of what you're talking about, so that if you had, um, I was drawing an x and y axis just to, as a reference point, um, but if you have your pole here, and say that you rotate um, something like 100 degrees, but your R value is negative, then you would just be backing up, going this way instead along the same line, okay? Um, all right, but hopefully you reviewed that in the homework that you did last night. Um, so those are just the essential polar ideas. Um, if you go ahead in your notes, 
we now have a problem where we are graphing. And for graphing, you can use um, your calculator. And then for the rest of it, I really want you to try to not use your calculator. Generally speaking, on the AP test, um, you would be probably given these in a non-calculator part of the test, but then they would provide you with a picture. So you wouldn't have to try to figure out the graph, but you wouldn't also have access to your calculator for like doing the mechanics of what we're about to learn. So, um, so as much as possible, just try to use your calculator only for the graphing part. So here we have a picture of our, we have the equation r equals four cosine theta. This actually turns out to be a circle and the circle goes through the pole and it also goes through a point over here on the right that um, corresponds to the uh, Cartesian plane four comma zero. So I ask you here, what is the area bounded by the curve? Well, based on geometry and based on the fact that you know this is a circle, area equals pi r squared is our formula for area. And so obviously this is four pi. Okay, well that's great, but most things don't turn into nice geometry things, okay? But when they do, that's fantastic. Um, we could sometimes with certain polar graphs even use our rectangular ideas about how to find area. So if you think about the definition of area by, bounded by a curve when we're in normal Cartesian coordinates, we cut that up into rectangles, right? So we would say here, like with this shape, I, if I were thinking about integrals, I'd be thinking about my little rectangles coming up here and fitting into this space and then thinking, okay, I'm going to let the number of rectangles go to infinity, right? Fill in all that space and then that would tell me the area. And so what I actually need is an equation for this curve since it happens to be a circle and I can see that the center is at 2, 0. I can figure out the equation of this circle. This would be x minus 2 squared plus y squared equals 4, okay? And then if I reorganize that to have um, just say this top portion, right, that's just going to be this square root. So 4 minus the quantity x minus 2 squared. And if I throw a dx and an integral onto this and say I'm going from x equals 0 to x equals 4, and then I double that because I would need this region as well to find the whole area. I should, in, I indeed do, also get 4 pi the same way we did with the geometry. Okay, so that's wonderful, but sometimes polar graphs aren't like this. Sometimes they're a little more complicated. And so think about times when you have like little loop-de-loops and things like that, like the lemmas gate or the um, rose curves or something like that. So we aren't going to be able to just chop it off into rectangles all the time. So what we actually are going to do is we end up chopping our curve up into slices again. Very common calculus idea, these slices. But the slices are these guys, these little wedges. Lost my pen. Okay, these little wedges like that. And so I'm going to draw in some that are actually bigger because that's actually really <laughs> time consuming to draw. But the idea is that you have all these wedges like this coming, like sweeping through the shape. So if you imagine, you know, how when your graph, um, when your calculator graphs a polar curve for you, how it comes along and like this point moves along like this and comes around, right? If you can imagine those wedges kind of like filling in like the shading behind that point, that's what we're doing is having these little wedges. And if we could add up all those wedges, um, all those sectors, then we would have the volume, okay? So that's actually what ends up happening, exactly. We already know that this shape has an answer of four pi for its area. So maybe the first thing I think about is, okay, I know that to find area of a sector in a circle, area of a sector, if I'm measuring my angle in radians is one half theta r squared. So maybe I go with that idea and I say, all right, well, I'm gonna try to do that. So if you think about the fact that you wanna do this over and over, you wanna have sectors repeatedly, right? As you go through the shape, right? You have all these sectors and you wanna add them all up. So adding up an infinite number of things, so that's an integral. And so this would become, I am gonna integrate and I'm gonna have one half and I'm going to have r squared. And then the theta is going to be the thing that changes, right? Because you're gonna have here and then here and then here, right? And so the angle is what's um, in 
motion, so to speak, as we move around the, the curve. And so you're going to go from the beginning theta to the ending theta. All of this is with respect to theta, all right? And so that becomes our area um, set up all the time in Kohler, all the time, one half r squared e theta. And you can see here, I've used the bounds zero and two pi. And we're just going to see how that bears out, okay? So as you go through all of this portion, it's just the mechanics of, you know, the simplifying. And then at this stage, you see that we did the identity that I mentioned in the warm up. And then you go ahead and you have your bounds, or you have your bounds here, and you're like all excited because you're like ready to get four pi. And what happens? Well, you get eight pi. So this is a problem. We know the answer should be four pi. We're getting eight pi. Seems like maybe something's wrong in our setup, right? So let's think about how we would know our beginning and our end. It isn't so obvious. So we want to start from here with drawing these wedge or thinking about these wedges coming out. And we want to keep going, get et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until we get to here and we're coming back in and then we're coming back. Ah, so the bounds are determined by when you go back to this pole. That's the key. We need to figure out when our curve hits the pole. Well, when we hit the pole, r, the radius, is zero. So this is actually what we want to solve. That's our ticket. We want to figure out when four cosine theta equals zero. Well, it turns out if you solve that, you get pi over two and three pi over two, as well as other angles. But these two would work as bounds then to get our correct values. Okay, so we want to change those. And when we change those bounds, we do indeed get four pi. So make this three pi over two, make this pi over two, and make this four pi. We'll, uh, we'll in, in turn make this four pi too. Now you might wonder, why did I show you the problem with the bounds wrong in the first place? What do you think a common issue is? You're right, having the wrong bounds. So by showing you having the wrong bounds, hopefully that will help you remember, oh yes, I need to make sure I think about when does my graph come back to the pole and that's going to determine the bounds on my integral, okay? So that was the point of doing it wrong. Okay, I'd like you to go ahead and try the second example.